I want to introduce our first two speakers. They come from the Nutrition Policy Institute. It was originally at UC Berkeley um, and, and has now moved to the University um, of California Office of the President. Uh, Pat Crawford uh, uh, is the first speaker, and Pat is probably, talk about uh, breaking trail, Pat is one of the foremost uh, scientists uh, who started studying food policy many, many years ago and put this uh, area of research on the map. Uh, she has appropriately conducted lo very long window long longitudinal studies of African American women trying to s understand the onset and, and uh, burden of, of obesity over time. She's an absolute pioneer in the field. And she'll be joined by Lorene Ritchie, who is also um, in a leadership position at the Nutrition Policy Institute. Uh, Lorene's work, along with Pat's, has focused quite a bit on school-based reforms, which I hope they'll be talking about a little bit today, as well as some of our federal food programs that, again, target these lower income populations, such as WIC and uh, food stamps or, or SNAP. So with that, I warmly welcome both of you to join, join us on the stage. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm actually going first. I'm Lorreen. Um, but Pat uh, will go second, and I always insist that she goes second because she is a much harder act to follow than I am, so I'm happy to, to be before her. Um, so uh, this morning, uh, Janet Napolitano, who's many of our boss, high up boss, uh, said a quote um, that good science is needed to inform good public policy. And at the Nutrition Policy Institute, we like to think that that's what we do, good science that can inform um, nutrition policy. Uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit about um, the methodology that we have used over the course of many years now to have our science findings be translatable into policy. And Pat is going to end with a few remarks upon that. But basically, through trial and error and the inspiration of Pat and the late Sarah Samuels, we have developed uh, what I call a trifecta um, of methods. Uh, we do the traditional quantitative data collection, but we marry that um, with qualitative data collection. And for those of you who are basic scientists, as, as I was trained, I used to poo-poo that kind of research and think, oh, um, how lame is that? You know, no control group, and you're asking people, random people, questions that are about their feelings. And what I have learned as the, uh, over the course of trying to inform decision and policy makers is that, yes, data is powerful and that quantitative information is very important, but the stories, the context, the voices of the actual people being affected speaks volumes. So we always marry the quantitative and the qualitative. And then the third piece, which I think is the most innovative, is rather than us as researchers going out to decision makers and saying, this is what we found and this is what you should do, we say, this is what we found, what do you think we should do? And we let them generate the recommendations, the ideas, and in doing so, by bringing forward a variety of stakeholders, we found that they're empowered to make the change, they're engaged in making the change, and, and, and our work is much less intensive. And then the last part, which I forgot to change this slide, but partner with an advocacy organization. You know as university folks, you, um, you can share information, you can't lobby, and you're walking in gray waters when you try to advocate, but advocates can do all of that for you. So if you have a good partnership, you're in really good shape. So I'm going to talk a little bit about early childhood and some of the research we've done to inform some of the environmental changes that we heard in this morning's talks were important um, to be done. And then Pat's going to talk about school-aged children. So why young children? Um, well, nearly 11 million US children under age 5 um, are in child care. So that is the biggest place that you can get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of reaching the most young children. And at these childcare sites, the t typical child consumes about half of their daily calories. We know from other studies that in early childhood is when those habits are formed. We talked a little bit about this morning of 
probably potentiating some of that food addiction in very young children. Well, the good habits and the bad habits tend to be formed very early on. Uh, child care is a wonderful opportunity for engaging parents. And if we're in the business of preventing bad habits, bad nutrition, poor physical activity, and obesity, and nearly one in four children are already overweight by the time they start school, well, you can't wait till school age before you start working on this problem. Um, and we also know that in addition to food habits, overweight tracks. So in 2008, we did a study, again, with some advocate partners, the California Food Policy Advocates, and they wanted us to tell them what was going on in the food environment in childcare. And like good researchers, the first, very first thing we did was go to the literature and we said, ah, well, we've been doing a lot of work in school, not hardly anything in childcare, and nobody's working in childcare, hardly anybody. So we were one of the first to publish a study that looked at all the child care settings in California. And what we found is that those that participated in the food program, that's called the child and adult care food program, it's the same or very similar to the school meal program, but it's the child care version for low income families. They did better. There was more milk served to kids, less juice, less sugary drinks. But still, a lot of kids were drinking whole milk um, when they should have been on lower fat, and a lot of kids were drinking we're not having water. So we worked with our advocate partners using that three trifecta method that I mentioned uh, to get a bill signed by Governor then Schwarzenegger in 2010, which went into effect in 2012. And I'm happy to say that this AB 2084 is to this date the most comprehensive beverage bill in childcare, in schools, anywhere in the nation. Um, and it says that kids uh, two and older must have lower fat milk. Juice can be served, but it must be 100% and no more than one age appropriate serving per day. Water must be available to children at all times. And sugary drinks not allowed. What was the impact of this policy? We found that there was an increase in every single one of those beverages. More, wa more water was served with meals and snacks easily available for self-serve. Juice, less juice was served more than once per day and sugary drinks went down. But when we asked people, what is your knowledge of the legislation? The answer was only 60%. So only 60% of the providers knew that this was a statewide law. And when we measured full compliance with all four of those beverage regulations, only about a quarter were fully compliant. So we knew our work was not done. We had not solved or fixed the childcare beverage environment. So we went to our conveners, our stakeholders, and said, what do you recommend? And this is what they said. We need beverage policy in all child care guidance. We need beverage policy in provider trainings. And we need advocacy for this kind of stuff in other places. So that led to a second bill, which in 2013 mandated that all child care providers get one hour of training on nutrition. Now that may sound like, wow, the person I leave my child with has only had one hour of training on nutrition. Prior to that, the number was zero. And there only is 15 hours total mandatory training for child care providers. So this was a huge step in the right direction. Um, the good news also is that as a result of these kinds of policy levers, as well as a lot of other activities going on, we are seeing improvements such that sugary drink consumption among this age group is going down. But we're not done. Uh, we still have work to do, and so we're following up with many other studies, and this is the kind of cycle that we like to do, where we do an initial study followed up with some findings. That results in some policy. We evaluate that policy, see what other tweaks we need to do. And so that's what we're continuing to do in the childcare world. And with that, I'm gonna pass the torch to Pat. Okay, thank you, Lorraine. I'm gonna take you one step farther now into schools. So I'm gonna give you a case study that really actually exemplifies the points that Lorene was making and it really reinforces some and it brings in an additional point. And this was, think back a few years, California was the first state in the country, thanks to our public health advocates and Harold Goldstein, they had really produced information on diabetes in the counties that caused 
those who were working in the legislature to put forth a couple of very progressive bills to get candy and chips and soda out of the California schools. But alas, while it was important to do, it was an unfunded mandate signed by a Republican governor, passed, but the School Nutrition Association said if you're going to do pass a law like that, you're going to have to provide some funding for us because about, you know, it, possibly half of their revenue was from the junk food that I just mentioned. Because that food was sold in the cafeteria a la carte, it was sold in vending machines, it was sold at school um, stores, all kinds of venues, and they were profiting by it and supporting their school meal program. So it languished in the legislature until the Department of Education said, how much is really lost if we do take those foods out and the leader of the nutrition program that said, if I can get some money, can we do a study? So we jumped on the opportunity to do a study in 16 schools. Um, we removed those three items. We um, gave the schools a very hefty amount because nobody wanted to try such a thing and lose a lot of money. So we, they were provided with funding from an outside source that was willing to do this to see how much they would actually lose. And so we went into the schools and we measured all the revenues and the expenses. And lo and behold, it was an enormous surprise to the school nutrition folks, to the researchers who should know, to the advocates, to the Department of Education, to people across the country. Those results were used immediately. 13 out of 16 schools made more money when they quit selling those foods. I mean, talk about an exciting study. So this is just an example of one school to show you what happened. That in the first part of the, uh, look to the left, the top line on the graph is that amount of total revenue. It's coming from those two lines below, that's a school meal program, and the competitive food or a la carte food, so separate foods that they sell. After it was changed in the summer, there was a big bleep because of uh, you know, some extra promotions in the cafeteria, but the lines ended up, look to the far right there, the lines ended up with the total amount being just the same as it was before, but all the money was coming from the school meal program. Hence the reason why that, was, uh, that information was provided to the advocates who then took it forth and said, we now can move forward. And the School Nutrition Association and the folks leading that said, we will agree. We can move forward without any costs um, you know, paid to the school. So it became the, uh, the law of the land in California, the first in the nation. But that's not the end of the story for us. We did the first study, but as Lorene said, research to policy is often, it has to be iterative and you have to keep on going. Because what's the first thing that happened after it became law? Industry, as Laura was saying. Well, those children, they've lost their freedom first of all, <laughs> they cannot buy those foods. So, and second of all, you know, that they're just gonna buy it before school or after school. So you've now pushed it into the marketplace where it shouldn't, you know, it should be more convenient in the schools. They shouldn't have to go to other, you know, stores along the way. So we conducted our next study and our next study was a dietary study of a large group of children showing how much of the candies, the chips, and the sweetened beverages they consumed at school, before school, after school. And what did we find? We found those bars going down, those are the consumption levels at school of those products went down. The little um, orangish bars or yellow bars going up, that's how much the consumption increased um, at home. So you can see bits of increase but that is not called compensation. So that data says children are eating less. And then the next thing that we did, of course, was to look and see if there was any change in the final outcome. We've looked at the nutrition of the children and the foods they were consuming. And while there's no cause and effect, we just looked at the fitness gram data from the state of California. So all children and their BMIs over the period and the line in the middle is the line where the legislation took place. And although those slopes don't look very great, 
those slopes are changing enough that the state of California has, the last time we looked a few years back, they'd already saved well over $20 million on the reduction in obesity. So the research cycle that Lorreen talked about, it's so important to go from the question to designing a study, to getting some funding to do it, to conducting it, to analyzing it, and not just to publish it, but to provide that information in a way that the advocates can use it to you know, further the, um, to advance the, the work that you're doing because it really, it will languish if it's just a policy. If you're just putting a policy in place, they can either be not implemented or in a worst case scenario, they could be reversed. So our work continues over time and we're, we're involved in many studies like this and we appreciate very much the opportunity we've had to share just a little tidbit of the kinds of studies that we do. So thank you very much. So, so here we have, California is uh, larger than most European nations. And here we have an example of radically changing the food environment for children. Just think of the impact, uh, just the size of the population and the impact that policies like this can have on kids. It's huge. Uh, we have a, a, a little time for questions. I just wanted to add an observation. Um, as a mom, again, of a daughter who played sports after school, and um, what I noticed was that after games, it was soccer she played, and so I'm sure I'm not alone in this room, um, being one of those moms. And all the parents who brought junk food after the game. So you'd be engaging in exercise. And um, as much as I tried to talk to the coach and other parents about the fact, could we just maybe bring some orange slices or something like that or apples? I was the healthy mom who was boring and all the other moms were really, you know, quite, um, <laughs> they were the go-to moms. So I'm just wondering if we can extend or if anybody's thought about extending this out to the sporting world because that message is not there at all either. Absolutely, there's room for more policy interventions, but the YMCA, for example, is one of the national leaders on adopting policy for their clubs and what can and cannot be uh, fed to children. Um, when I was a young mother, and this was many years ago, uh, my sons both played baseball, and I remember going, what's it called, opening day, where you walk around the track and you all, they all have their uniforms, and the kids in front of us were sponsored by Krispy Kreme. <laughs> And I took a deep breath and I started to have a little tantrum and my husband knows about these and I said, oh my God, now they're going to see that. That's like walking advertising. And he goes, no, they're not paying attention. They're into the baseball. And a, another kid walks by us and says, oh mom, I want a Krispy Kreme. <laughs> and I said, yep. So it just speaks to the fact that um, if we really want children to make healthy choices, we're going to have to ha surround them with healthy choices. And of course, you can have a Krispy Kreme once in a while, but it Right now, they're ubiquitous. Yeah. I was just at the Warriors exhibition game last week. There, well, no, when they won, they beat Portland. And, <laughs> and no, not, that was the regular season. They won in the exhibition. There were no advertisements for junk food in Oracle Arena. 